Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have Russ Skiba, who should be able to unmute. Thank you, Ms. Lacey and members of the council. I appreciate the opportunity. This is Russ Skiba. I appreciate the opportunity to speak this to this amendment, and I um, urge you to support Amendment 4. Um, there is no question that this has been, in the past, sold as an issue of affordability by the mayor and by the plan department. In its um, introduction, called Proposed Housing Density in Residential Districts, a Guide to the Proposed Text Amendment to the City of Bloomington's Unified Development Ordinance. I urge you to look that up online. Uh, the plan department says, the inclusion of plexes as a legal option in all parts of Bloomington increases opportunity for a larger swath of our residents to be able to locate in desirable neighborhoods, increasing opportunity for racial and socioeconomic diversity in these areas. Just a little while later, they state that the comprehensive plan will uh, gives the following guidance goals and objectives. In other words, this plan is meeting the goals of the comprehensive plan. And that goal is to encourage a range of diverse housing types in the downtown and nearby areas where appropriate with an emphasis on affordable and workforce housing. So, you know, why would there be such a shift? Why would they start out saying this is so important for affordable housing and equitable housing, and now it isn't? Well, pretty clearly, it's from an understanding that nothing, the research, local testimony, local data, that nothing supports the assertion that upzoning can in any way um, support or increase affordability. And, I, and I, I, what I don't understand are those people who say that research shows that upzoning increases affordability. Uh, the latest study done by Daniel Kuhlman uh, looked at Minneapolis. The upzoning there has been held up as a model by the mayor and many of those who support upzoning throughout the country. Kuhlman found that not only did upzoning increase housing prices, but it increased the prices in relatively small houses and those in low valued neighborhoods. He said these results may raise concerns from those concerned about neighborhood change, displacement, and particularly the availability of affordable single family homes. If developers use the upzoning to replace existing family homes with attached two or three unit structures, it should not be surprising that they will start with relatively inexpensive and small houses. In a five-year study in Chicago, MIT researcher Yona Freemark found that upzoning almost immediately caused higher property prices, leading him to conclude that those hoping to address affordability, quote, may need to look for other solutions. Both of those studies found that housing prices went up almost immediately, almost immediately, even before the construction of new housing allowed under the upzoning. Why? I'm sorry, Mr. Skiba, but your time has been exhausted. I Thank urge you for your to comments. Support Amendment 4. Thank you. Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have a person with the screen name Mark's iPad who should be able to unmute and state their full name. Hi, my name is Mark Cornett. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, listening to me tonight. I support Amendment 4. And I've been listening to the conversation tonight, uh, as always. And we have a conflict in this process. We have, let's increase density. Let's say we're going to increase affordability. And then when the affordability component collapses, let's say we want to increase density and hope for affordability. Why wouldn't everyone support this amendment that, it, that at this time is the only thing supporting affordability in this process that everyone said they wanted to support in the beginning. It was because of racism, it was because of diversity, it was because of, because of, because of. Let's continue that and promote affordability any way we can. We have a very specific rental market overlay in this town that directly affects and inflates housing costs. It is more expensive to rent than to own. So if I were looking at a baseline, I would say protect all of the core neighborhood housing stock, 
that can be owned if renting costs more. That would be a place to start. Now, how do we add to the housing stock after that? We know that ADUs are a way to combine, to marry, if you will, ownership and rental. So it, su it supplies opportunity for the young folks that keep saying, I want to rent and I don't want to own. And it protects the ownership component of the existing core housing stock. We don't like to talk about the word investor. We don't like to talk about the words development. We like to talk about housing. Unfortunately, this town can't remove the first to get to the second. We need to be able to understand that we're totally affected by this process and that we need to protect it in any, by any means necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have a person with the screen name, Eric, who should be able to unmute and state their full name. Good evening. My name is Eric Ost, and I request that you vote to adopt Amendment 4. Affordable housing is a critical need in Bloomington. Our lived experience is that simply relying on traditional market forces and supply and demand are not reliable ways to achieve pressing common goals. This amendment is an assertive, definite step toward affordability. Our community is engaged, and this engagement presents us with a profound opportunity. I therefore respectfully request council and administration to actively engage the community in additional steps toward effectively and sustainably creating and facilitating housing for all people. But tonight, I sincerely respect or request that you vote to adopt this amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Who do we have next? Next, we have Richard Durison, who should be able to unmute. Uh, hello, my name is Richard Durison. I live in Elm Heights, and I uh, urge that the city council vote for amendment four. Uh, I really like what Jeff Richardson said, uh, and Eric kind of echoed uh, a little while ago about uh, the expertise available in this community. And I think hope going forward that we will, when we're done with the, the, this UDO process, that uh, the city administration and the city council work together with members of the community to figure out ways to address affordability and housing in Bloomington. I don't think amendment four is a perfect solution, but it's a step in the right direction. Without it, uh, real estate speculators are free to maximize profits by maximizing the number of bedrooms in duplexes rather than provide housing to those who really need it. And I'm, I'm just going to stop there. That, please support Amendment 4. Thank you. Who do we have next, please? Next, we have a person with a screen named Steve who should be able to unmute and state their name for the record. Yes, uh, my name is Steve Lehman. I live in Arden Place. I support Amendment 4. I believe plexes and multifamily projects um, need to be strictly managed. First reason would be to serve Bloomington residents. Um, they need to be affordable. And second, they cannot have adverse impact on neighboring properties. These negative impacts could include maintenance, parking, traffic, and especially stress on infrastructure. We have a lot of issues with that in Bloomington. I would like to see the city focused on home ownership via a task force with Bloomington residents on the task force versus outside consultants. We've had a lot of outside consultants making suggestions to the city. And I guess on the outside, it, it, it kind of looks like these folks, you know, are educated and look at different areas in the country and everything. But on the other side of the coin, I think that uh, people in Bloomington kind of know what they like too. Um, so I say, please support the uh, residents of Bloomington in a productive way. I believe that home ownership is the key to safety and security. Thanks. For your comments. Who do we have next, please? Next, we have a person with a screen name able to unmute and state her full name. 
I need to unmute now. You? Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You okay. have three minutes. Thank, Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. This is Lois Sabo Skelton. I'm at 121 North Overhill Drive in Bloomington, Indiana. Today, we all know very well that many people, singles and families, have lost their homes and apartments because they couldn't pay the rent or make the payments. We know that this past year, we've had the pandemic to blame as we've had to shut down our businesses, schools, etc., protect us from this deadly virus. But I think sometimes we forget that these very same people were losing their homes and apartments before the pandemic due to the incredibly high rents, housing payments, interest, you name it. And this has been going on for decades. So why not use all of the options available to help our people in need? Tonight, we have an opportunity, you have an opportunity to make a real difference by adding further options. A real start in this area of affordability and equity. And you know what? We will not be any better than any local or outside developer if we lose this chance this chance to truly develop and take first steps towards a humane plan using once again all the tools or more tools that we have. Let's use them all. We have ideas and experts coming forth from our public willing to join in with our administration to work on this critical situation. Of course, nothing is perfect. But as many have said, we can adjust if needed as we work together to make this a solid beginning as we support this Amendment 4 and the ideas offered tonight. So once again, why not use all the options to help our people in need and to build a better design towards affordability and equity and make it an actual reality? Let's use all the options. Please do not deny our people in need in Bloomington and in our area every possible chance and support Amendment 4. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you very much. Who do we have next? Next, we have Tom Millen. You should be able to unmute. Hello, I'm uh, Tom Millen. I live in Bryant Park neighborhood. And I support Amendment 4 as well. Um, it's sensible. It's an option to make uh, home ownership uh, affordable. That's it. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have um, Deidre Todd, who should be able to unmute. Hello. While, Hello. Sitting, while sitting here listening to this, and all the talk about density, I decided to do a little research. And I did some major cities in uh, Indiana. Fort Wayne per square mile, the density is 200 or 2,445. For Columbus, it's 1,674. For Lafayette, it's 2,426. For South Bend, it's 2,454. For Indianapolis, it's 2,373. For Bloomington, it's 3,597. I think we should stop talking about density and start talking about affordable housing. I support Amendment 4. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, do you have anyone else that's ready, Ms. Lacey? I will remind enough. the no, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, there are no more hands raised presently. I have, oh, excuse me. I spoke too soon. Um, Peter Bogdanov um, should be able to unmute. Hi, I'm in support of Amendment 4. If the idea was to make housing affordable, why not make it affordable? Put your vote where your mouth is and do what's right and somehow somehow fix or help to fix the problem that was already created with this whole plex issue support amendment four thank you very much thank you very much for your comments 
Um, there are no more raised hands. I have approximately 10 um, comments that I've been asked to read. Shall I go ahead and do that? Um, were they instructed to speak publicly as opposed to reading messages? Um, I Well, that, that's okay. Disregard that. Yes, please go ahead and read. Thank you. Okay. This is Janet Stavropoulos and I reside in Bloomington District 2. I urge the council to pass amendment four and five. From the screen name, James Allison, if you truly favor affordability, you most must vote for amendment four. From the screen name, Bose iPhone, I'm out of town, can't zoom, but if council is really serious about affordability, there is no reason whatever not to support amendment four, do it. From Kathleen Myers, I strongly support Amendment 4. About 90% of the people slash city council members that supported duplex, duplexes over the last few weeks and months have cited affordability as their primary reason. Now is your opportunity to follow up on your vision. I also want to note that Amendment 5, when is heard, should be passed. Currently, there are no sidewalks or at least three blocks to the east, west, and south of Bryan Park. There are very few sidewalks in Green Acres. Residents must be able to cite traffic and safety as a valid concern to object to duplexes that do not address parking congestion. Please support Amendment 4 and 5. My name is Dave Stewart and I live in the Bryan Park neighborhood. Please read my comment slowly as it is far less than three minutes long. I support Amendment 4. What is the intent of increasing density in the core neighborhoods by changing the zoning laws? If affordability is the goal, then Amendment 4 is an excellent method to ensure that. If, however, the change of zoning in the core neighborhoods is a proposal to create more housing stock with the assumption that more housing stock will result in depressing housing cost, then the change in zoning is hoping that market forces will affect the change of cost in housing. The problem with hoping that market forces will affect the hope for decrease in housing cost is that there is no evidence that this has ever occurred. Trinitas is not, Trinitas is an excellent real-time example of the lack of oversight. Trinitas is an excellent real-time example of what the lack of oversight will result in, and that result is not an increase in affordability. Please support Amendment 4. Thank you. My name is Linda Stewart, and I live in the Bryan Park neighborhood. The key is whether be built in order to be rented or going to be built in order to be sold. A two bedroom residence will have a purchase price that is less than a three bedroom residence. If the reason to change the zoning in core neighborhoods is to increase affordability and result in a decreased housing cost, then amendment four and limiting the number of bedrooms in each plex is an excellent of that goal. If, however, the change in zoning is being proposed in the core neighborhoods in order to create more rental units, then there is no reason to limit the number of bedrooms. As Peter Dorfman stated earlier, the result of the UDO without Amendment 4 will be to create more rental units, and someone who is renting does not build equity. Please support Amendment 4. Thank you very much. From Sandra Tokarski from Granville Hill, Grandview Hills neighborhood. Thank you to Susan Sandberg and Dave Rallo for your work on this enduring issue. I urge all council members to vote for Amendment 4. Thank you. I am uh, Veda Stanfield. I live in the NWS. I urge the council to adopt this Amendment 4. It is an incentive, not something that is forced on anyone. Please use this amendment as one tool to incentivize the possibility of some more affordable housing. This is Michelle Henderson. I live um, in the near west side, please read my comment. I ask you to vote for this amendment to support affordable housing for, for the duplexes, which will replace currently inexpensive rental houses in core neighborhoods. I would prefer to see a commitment to providing financial support slash rent payments for the low income renters who will be displaced by this change in zoning, which will replace currently affordable housing with market price rentals in the core neighborhoods. If you care about social justice and supporting the most vulnerable citizens you represent, you will vote for this minimal effort to provide some affordable housing. To be honest, it is a pathetic effort to support people who really need your help now, but I hope you will at least make the effort to help. Thank you. I am Kathleen Sedelli, a longtime homeowner in Elm Heights, and I have attended all these zoning meetings. I strongly support Amendment 4 and other efforts toward creating more affordable housing throughout Bloomington. 
I am Marsha Marcia Barron. I live in Elm Heights, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak on Amendment 4, which I strongly support. This is a terrific amendment. It should not be divisive at all. It is predicated on one thing we all agree. We want and badly need, namely, more affordable housing. If what we wanted is more opportunities for developers to get richer, then sorry, the amendment will not be what you want. If, if what is wanted is density for density's sake, with no concern about how expensive it is, the amendment will not be what you want. If what you want is more affordable housing, this is perfect. We need to incentivize affordable housing, and this does exactly that. It was alleged by Jackie Scanlon that this only provides rental housing and doesn't help with the shortage of home ownership. This makes no sense. If I want to buy a duplex for myself to live in, then I can rent out the other half, and this amendment doesn't stop me from doing that. It provides an incentive for me not to charge high rent. That is all. It also allows me the option of charging higher rent as long as I meet the requirements. Where is the problem? But in addition, let's not forget that if I want to own a house and make it more affordable for myself by renting part of it, I can have an ADU. So once again, I am baffled by Jackie Scanlon's allegation. I cannot see how it would create a barrier for, home, for a homeowner wishing to rent out part of their home, either by having an ADU or, or by buying or creating a duplex. I want to add in response to a comment that I would love to see affordability incentives that apply to single family homes, and I would welcome the suggestions of those who want to write one up. I too lament the number of luxury single, single family houses being built, and I lament the practice of flipping houses and would be thrilled to see it dis disincentivized. But for now, let's support what's on the table and which in no way precludes coming up with incentives against flipping houses or building luxury houses. Please support Amendment 4. Uh, I see one raised hand in Vox Booker, who should be able to unmute. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, you have three minutes. Hello, Council. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. My continued gratitude for the tremendous amount of patience that everyone has shown in this process. Um, just a couple of things. I wasn't going to speak, but uh, I would feel remiss if I didn't say that Affordable housing doesn't just occur in a, in a vacuum. It's something uh, that is, you know, subjected to the same principles that the rest of the market is. We can't just uh, suddenly say, hey, uh, if you're going to build this one type of housing, you have to have all these affordable uh, components. Uh, if that was easy to do, uh, we could just put an affordable component on the entire market. Uh, but we know that that's not the reality. Uh, there are some folks who I think are being disingenuous with this argument. I don't really think it is about uh, creating affordability. I think it is about uh, forcing out this type of housing that they don't um, they don't value as much. For me, uh, I'm a you know almost forty year old uh, renter. Uh, it would be a, a delightful thing if I could buy a duplex and, and, and maybe it doesn't need to be a rental. Maybe I put my 67 year old father and the other half beside me. I love my dad. I don't necessarily need him to live uh, in the bedroom next to me, but there are a lot of folks that uh, have parents that are aging and we would like to see them be able to stay in place near us. Um, I think it's important that we don't continue to uh, prioritize, you know, one housing, one type of housing, which can honestly be McMansions, uh, and then hamstring another. Uh, I just want you all to carefully consider that, yeah, we are a community with a lot of expertise. Uh, some of these folks that are talking just didn't suddenly do research. They've been researching these problems for years, in some case, decades. So, uh, it's really difficult when I hear folks that are in homes and, and folks that um, make up with incomes, you know, paternal, paternalistically uh, tell me what's best for me. I think that if someone uh, feels like a duplex is the type of home they want to uh, live in, that uh, we should allow them to do that. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you all. Thank you for your comments. 
Do we have anyone else that you can see, Ms. Lacey? I have one more comment in the chat. Um, this is Marsha Campbell. I live in Elm Heights neighborhood. I support Amendment 4. I urge the members of the City Council to demonstrate their commitment for affordable and equitable housing by voting yes on the affordability amendment. Okay, thank you very much. And seeing no more raised hands, um, we'll now return to Council for formal, I'm sorry, final comment on Amendment 4 for Ordinance 21-23. Um, we will start with, well, I see a hand up, Council Member Rollo. Thank you, President Sims. Um, this is the only means at our disposal to ensure affordability by plexing. Otherwise, it really is a faith-based uh, approach, faith-based market approach. And I would just point to the Trinitas petition at Kmart to disabuse you of that faith in the market. This amendment was uh, vetted and, and worked on by Kerry Thompson, 20, 26 year career, uh, former CEO of Habitat for Humanity. And she believes it is workable. You saw the pro forma that was offered and I've seen that in others. And it convinces me that it is possible to make profit uh, with this amendment. So it, is, it still is profitable. Um, this does run counter to the laissez-faire approach uh, that the market rentals will provide affordable housing. Um, but I think that we've all now been, uh, you know, counseled even by staff, which formally, and, and the mayor, which uh, advertised that this would produce affordable housing, they no longer support that. So this is really the only means we have. Uh, the, the amendment provides incentives for affordability, particularly for workforce housing, which we continually state as a goal. If the owner doesn't wish to, uh, to go to the affordability route, it still allows plexing for rental for four bedrooms, two on each side. So um, yes, it limits uh, plexus to two bedrooms per plex, but that coincides with many of the, the homes in the core neighborhoods that are going to be affected by plexing. So um, the extra bedroom incentive for affordability works. Uh, it can be done for profit, as I said, and it can be used for to create affordable housing. So let's use it. If it fails, then we can revisit it as we've been told, this is an experiment. We're going to revisit it every six months or so. And so we can track to see if it works. And it may be part of the solution, not the entire solution, of course, but it may render affordable housing, the workforce housing we're looking for. Um, if we don't employ this at this point, then we simply give up on affordable housing th through plexing. Uh, and we surrender to the market rate ap approach. Uh, when we had that opportunity uh, uh, to, to uh, work for affordable workforce housing. So please support Amendment 4. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Member Rollo. Okay, um, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you, President Sims, if I may. Um, I have a question. And this needs to be directed to someone who was very much involved as the architect for this amendment, and that is Carrie Thompson. It is my understanding, she's brought it to my attention, that she was perhaps misquoted earlier in the beginning as this was being presented with respect to uh, an issue involving habitat. And I would like to ask her at this time, uh, if you will allow me to do so, to ask Ms. Thompson to um, uh, come on to answer that question about what she, sh she would like to correct for the record? Um, I will defer or ask our parliamentarian to get him to uh, become involved with this. 
I think we're in the period for council final comments. And I'm not so sure it would be proper for a member of the public um, to, to be involved in that manner. Well, um, so we, let's, we see, let's see what the parliamentarian, let's see what the parliamentarian says. Thank you. Um, my view is that it would be up at your discretion as chair, um, President Sims, but also uh, highly irregular for our normal uh, conduct of business with an interest of uh, sort of equal opportunity for all commenters, um, even those who may have been um, helpful in, in drafting a, a proposal for council members. Uh, I certainly would welcome the clarification via email or otherwise, but uh, that's just my view. Yes, is there any way that you can rebut that, Council Member Sandberg? Well, again, I do not have the information that she deems to have been incorrectly stated. I think this best comes from her herself to have an opportunity to correct the record. I'm just not so sure about how proper that is. Um, and I'm not so sure what it is she wants to rebut. Um, it has to do with the statement made by Ms. Scanlon regarding Habitat which she, of course, having been the executive director for many years, would like to clarify and correct for the record. I would, I would respectfully ask her to be able to have that opportunity. Okay, this is not public comment. I, it is my question I, I, that yes, I am sir. directing toward uh, Ms. Thompson. Yes, I'm trying to look for a time limit on this. I don't want this to drag out because this is not normal. Um, I don't think it will take her long. I hope, um, I'm looking at less than a minute. Um, Ms. Lacey, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Um, oh. Okay, now I do. Um, Ms. Thompson should be able to unmute and I'll start the time for one minute. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to um, correct the record that um, Habitat homeowners are not required to sell their homes back to Habitat. Um, they are, they have the opportunity to sell them on the open market. Um, there are uh, shared equity agreements for a number of years, um, but after that, uh, the homeowner gets full equity in that house. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. And I thank you for allowing the question to be answered. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Okay, um, we're still in final comments on amendment four of ordinance 21-23. So do we have any further comments? I'm sorry, yeah, final comments from our council members. Council member Flaherty. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone's comments tonight. I, I will not be supporting this amendment. I don't have a whole lot to add to the many reasons that Ms. Scanlon and Mr. Robinson shared based on their education and experience as urban planning professionals as to why this amendment is bad public policy that will not accomplish the sponsor's stated goals. Rather, the practical up to upshot seems to be to further limit the likelihood of any duplexes being added to our mix of housing options and also to potentially exclude families from taking advantage of living in a duplex. Of course, the likely outcome uh, I just mentioned is the preferred goal of the amendment sponsors who voted for an outright ban on duplexes for most residential lots of the city. If the sponsors were truly serious about adapting the incentives program to smaller scale homes in order to increase affordable housing, they should be strong advocates for applying their proposed policy to detached single family homes. Because of course, it's with detached single family homes that we will see many more housing units developed and therefore, by the sponsor's own reasoning, a much better option for adding more deed-restricted affordable units to the community. But of course, we haven't seen such a proposal, and the amendment sponsor stated that they are uninterested in bringing one. Nor did we hear from a single supporter of Amendment 4, including its authors in the community, that they would support having incentives for affordability with detached single-family homes like this. Similarly, none of the commenters in support of Amendment 4 were interested in this affordability approach last week, when I believe to a person, they advocated for outright bans on duplexes. They decry the outcomes of market forces, but prefer to rely almost exclusively on those market forces to supply single family homes. A quick note regarding affordability with missing middle housing types like duplexes. These housing types provide greater market rate affordability, something that um, some opponents call naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, but at market rate affordability, uh, and they help support lower income households than do detached single family homes. 
This is almost universally true when you are comparing homes of similar size, quality, and age, which is why pretty overwhelmingly, urban planners and housing economists support reallowing these types of historic homes in residential areas without restrictions like the one we're discussing. By way of empirical evidence from the American Community Survey, here are the average national incomes of households who live in different housing types. Obviously, this is national data, but it helps paint the picture. Household income for detached single family homes, $95,000. For townhomes, $77,000, only 81% as much. For small scale attached housing, $49,000. That's only 52% as much as detached single family home dwellers. For mid size attached housing, $58,000. For larger attached housing, $65,000. These provide affordability due to their inherent characteristics of sharing the cost of land, sharing walls, um, and of course, affordability is only one part of the many reasons why missing middle housing options help us meet our city goals and should be encouraged, not discouraged. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Flaherty. Do we have any other comments, final comments from council members? Council Member Pete Moss Smith and then Council Member Smith. Yeah, I don't uh, buy the premise that if I care about affordable housing, I should vote for this amendment. I reject that premise completely. Um, I believe as Council Member Flaherty has pointed out and as many studies have shown that um, relatively, uh, relative to single family homes, duplexes are more affordable in and of themselves. Um, they also are more energy efficient and furthermore, uh, within uh, because they because of allowing them uh, in communities already built out, um, there is also a, a, a benefit as far as transportation costs being less. So I just see this amendment as misguided. Um, I also um, find it hard to believe that the sponsors really are excited about duplexes given that they wanted to do away with them completely in single family neighborhoods. Um, so I just, uh, I'm also looking at this in the context of already um, having amendment three passed. I did not vote for amendment three, but it was adopted. And that only allows 15 duplex units in the entire city which um, as uh, Jackie Scanlon pointed out is less than 1% of all properties that are currently zoned R1, R2, R3. So it, it really is death by a thousand cuts. I mean, let's just add more bureaucracy, more conditions, more red tape to creating duplexes so that nobody is going to want to invest the time and money to build them. That's the context in which I see Amendment four. And I do support affordable housing. I have um, personally negotiated with developers to get affordable units in multifamily housing projects. Um, I think uh, throwing out Trinitas at the Kmart East site is really a red herring in this case. It's not comparing apples to apples. Um, and I, I do pledge to continue to work on affordable housing solutions. Um, I think that duplexes, just by their very nature, are relatively more affordable than the single family housing form that the sponsors obviously uh, value more highly. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Pima Smith. Um, before we go to Councilmember um, Smith, um, what I'd like to do, and again, this was not normal by any means, and um, I will discuss it with our parliamentarian and our council staff. I doubt if it'll be replicated in the future. Um, however, we did allow Ms. Carrie Thompson to have a rebuttal to something apparently that Ms. Scanlon said. Um, it is my understanding that, that, that Ms. Scanlon deserves a minute as well to um, state her position if that was true or not or, or respond. I just think that's the fair thing to do and then we'll move forward. Um, so is Ms. Scanlon, are you present? Uh, hi, James. Uh, this is Eric Grulick, Senior Zoning Painter. Uh, 
Mrs. Scanlon is unavailable at the moment, but uh, she doesn't recall uh, necessarily addressing the habitat uh, issue of whether or not they're required to resell to habitat or not. So, you know, we, we don't okay. really have an issue with that statement, okay. I guess. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Mr. Krulik. Um, if she's not available, then we'll move on. Thank you very much. Council Member Smith. Yes, thank you, President Sims. Um, this amendment, which I'm supporting, of course, um, is a controlled, it's proactive action um, because uh, we see some of the trends that have happened across the country um, where people in their neighbor, in their inner cities, in their municipalities, they can't afford to live there and work there. Um, you see, um, well, there was an issue with our local police. They have a hard time buying a home here. So they may live in Ellettsville. Um, our firemen may live in Ellettsville. There's, there's a lot of different issues that are going on. Um, cities um, can't afford, uh, the people can't afford to live there. In Bloomington, we have this trend now that's going on and it, and it mirrors some of the national trends that uh, real estate, rental, and homes are becoming so expensive, people cannot live in their communities and work there. So I see this as a very reasonable uh, amendment that we can revisit down the road and take a look and see if it is helping us. Um, I can't see a way that uh, opponents can really not want to support affordable housing. Um, it's, it, it is what's the, the biggest problem we have here. We have enough uh, places for students. Uh, and you see, again, yeah, Trinitas and the marketplace is a great example of what's going on. Um, it's not, it's not affordable. So I, in a way, what we're doing is we're trying to mitigate um, the tyranny of the market forces. And so I have to say that this is a good, well-intended, well-meaning uh, amendment that I will be supporting tonight. And I, I hope that uh, other council members will help in passing this. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member Smith. Um, any further comments from council members? Council member Rosenbarger. Thank you. I will not be supporting this amendment tonight. Um, mostly I'm in agreement with, if, with the reasons for staff. I don't want to get into those since they were already said. Um, but you know, I think we need more housing. We need it in many forms, especially missing middle. I think we've already limited duplexes enough. Um, we've also disallowed quads and triplexes from these zones but you know we've made them conditional we've made the buffer and we've made a cap so i don't really want to limit them any further i think we need to be like staff said more flexible with duplexes um we need to encourage folks to create space for their aging parents we need to have plexes that are large enough for families we need homeowners to have the ability to build equity and we just need a wider variety of housing options whether that is rental or owner um, I think I sound like a broken record on this one, but plexes are cheaper to rent and own than single family homes when you're comparing apples to apples. So an, a new build single family home costs more to rent or own than a newly built plex and an older single family home costs more to rent or own than an older duplex. You can figure that out just by looking at rentals that are available right now in Bloomington or talking to folks that rent or own, of course. Uh, I mean, duplexes are by their very nature, just more affordable than single family homes. Um, I also really love the idea of treating single family homes the same as duplexes. So if we wanna look at a more comprehensive approach to affordability, I am all about that. And I think this council or this council with the administration could do that in the future. So, um, you know, if that means regulating both more, I think that's okay. If that means not regulating them, anymore i think that's okay too but i think two houses is basically the same as one house in my book so um i'm okay with treating them the same 
Okay, that's all I have for tonight. I guess I will also just add, like, I appre appreciate everyone who commented tonight and the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Rosenbarger. Do you have any further comments from Council Members? Council Member Bowling. Thank you. I could point out that uh, Ms. Southern made the case against Amendment 4, I think. For many like them, a duplex is a way to supplement one's income and pay one's taxes. I could point out that Mr. Lawrence's example didn't include costs of HVAC or of a bathroom or of a second meter hook right. on. I could point right. out that uh, no one's about to flip a house in SOMAX that sold for $1.7 million this year to turn it into rentals, even if it does have five bedrooms and six bathrooms. But I want to address the concern best vocalized by Mr. Lewis, that I or others who oppose amendments like this are impugning the motives of supporters. Are landlords who speak against plexus somehow more virtuous? If pointing out hypocrisy is impugning motives, then there is no basis for debate whatsoever. Some proponents of Amendment 4 want to keep holding its opponents responsible for everything said by one opponent. If that's, that's true, then they should be held to the same rhetorical standard. Mr. Dorfman, for example, characterizes his opponents with words like squirming away from arguments. He and others have, have accused their opponents of being ideological, that we are not being honest, that the city has a profit motive. One opponent called rentals money-making machines, and some of the other proponents literally were talking about the rentals they own. Then by the proponent's own logic, there are some people here possessing some of these money-making machines. Meanwhile, the Herald Times has reached out saying they've gotten inquiries from readers about whether council members are landlords and or whether they live in neighborhoods affected by the proposed zoning changes. Opponents of Plexus would not stop going on about how these meetings should be happening in person. In my direct and frequent experience, including during the debate over ADUs, neighborhood activists would boo and hiss at those whom they opposed, whether members of council or the public, when they were in person. And they have the nerve to declare the debate divisive as if the demagoguery was not a driver of that division. I've had so many ideas attributed to me, so many words put in my mouth. If there's dishonesty, it's in the pretense that opponents of this update to the UDO are not themselves projecting all the rhetorical techniques and motive imputing they're using onto their opponents. I've been a strong opponent of planned staff initiatives before. Not two months ago, I supported 2106 and bitterly opposed the mayor's refusal to stop sweeping the homeless in the winter during the pandemic. I have serious criticism of the way that the UDO has been handled and that it has contributed to the toxicity of this debate. But the mayor is a human being, for God's sake, as our planning staff. He's doing what he thinks is best, even as every speaker here thinks that of themselves. I do want to close on a positive note by giving credit where it's due. I generally fervently disagree with Margaret Clements. But everything she said in her comment on this amendment, I agree with wholeheartedly. She's precisely identified the source of all this division, the de facto municipality that annexes cities like ours from within. Before I would tell any proponent of Amendment 4 to sell their rentals, I would tell IU to do so first. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bowen. Do we have any other Council Members? Council Member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you again to all of my colleagues, all of you, um, and especially thank you to the public for, for being part of this conversation um, so persistently uh, and for helping inform my thinking on these issues. Um, several nights ago, I can't even remember the specific zoning item we were debating at the time, I observed that we are obligated to examine any research and comment in the light of how our neighborhoods have evolved to date. And we're obligated to do the best we can to anticipate how plexes would actually play out in this city, a university town where we have over 60% rentals and an unrelenting interest from developers in creating more. And where local wages are simply not rising fast enough to keep up with the market rate for housing. I don't believe we have enough, we currently have enough tools in place to dissuade those developers and property owners who see the powerful profit potential in just creating more market student rentals, market rates to student rentals. As our planning staff pointed out, we rightly have controls in place to ensure that plexes are not wildly out of character with the surrounding neighborhood. 
I believe the proposed amendment has the potential to help ensure that where plexes are added, they actually help us with a stubborn problem of housing affordability here in Bloomington. And I'm willing to support this amendment. I could be wrong. And I look forward to evaluating the zoning decisions we've made, all of them, in the next year. I'll be supporting Amendment 4. Thank you for your comments. Um, I, Council Member Sandberg. Yes. In bringing forward this amendment, I do so with complete earnestness and honesty in wanting to promote housing affordability in this community. And so all of the impugning of motives aside, uh, rest assured that all along throughout this debate, this has not been against the form of plexus. It has been against the locations for where they are being placed. And as an at-large representative, I feel very honestly that I am representing the majority of people who have both weighed in throughout this entire debate, as well as people that I've had communication with outside of these Zoom meetings. And of course, the issue of the plexus has been decided. So Council Member Rollo and myself moved on to trying to mitigate any future potential harm that we could anticipate coming into the core neighborhoods. This is, this is going to be an impact of R1, R2, and R3. It has nothing to do with R4, which we feel more comfortable in allowing uh, multiplexes to develop as they will at market rates and, and as the um, planning department sees fit as uh, applications come forward. So this again is both a protective measure for the individuals that I feel I mostly represent, as well as my being on the record for my entire tenure on this council as being someone who does champion affordability affordable housing. It has plagued this community for decades, well before I joined this council and all the times that, that I have been serving this public. This is an honest effort to use tools in our toolbox to create some affordability that will help integrate any plexes that will be developed in R1, R2, and R3. I do so with all due respect to people who oppose this amendment and um, I hope for your support in getting it through as just one measure to try to make a dent in our affordable housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Um, and my comments is um, we definitely have multiple tools in our toolbox to, to work um, toward affordable housing um, issues. Um, my position is that this amendment is not one of those tools. Um, we are in a housing crisis. Our country and our state is in a housing crisis. We do have an overall affordability crisis as well. I mentioned tools, multiple tools we have earlier. One of those creative tools, um, if I can just piggyback a little bit, is Council Member Ron Smith's idea of doing something um, very foundational, possibly with some of the ARPA funds with, in that regard with home ownership and affordability. I can support that, but that is not part of this discussion tonight. We, or I want to increase housing inventory of all types, and that includes duplexes. Council members Piedmont Smith and I sponsored a Amendment um, 2. It passed 9 to 0. Now, that was in the vein of seeking middle ground or compromise, which I thought was between the buy rights and the zero development of plexus. I also supported Amendment 3, which added a cap of 15 duplexes per year with a 150 foot buffer, again, in the vein of seeking middle ground or compromise. I think this amendment goes further beyond that and in fact starts to create barriers to duplex de um, development in my opinion. 
I know I'm not an expert. I'm just an elected official. But what I do know is that supply and demand works, but supply must be commensurate with the demand. And that must be achieved through the creation and addition to our housing stock. And that includes duplexes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking around, seeing no more comments. Uh, you had Council Member Allo. Yes, are, are we allowing a second bite? Um, I, Council Member Flaherty, I do not believe we are. What, what does, yes, we are. Does that go against our suspended rules? Um, I, I would say most to the letter of the suspended rules that we agreed on would be to have a three minute limit per council member, uh, including um, multiple bites, so to speak, if, if you reserve time. For instance, I didn't keep track of Council Member Rallo's time. I'm not sure. I will say that we've been a little bit fluid with this. Uh, you know, uh, after Amendment 1, we had allowed four minutes uh, based on a sort of accidental uh, first comment going to four minutes. And also, I um, we had some level of, of rebuttal or a second comment and debate uh, on a previous amendment or two that I don't we think we strictly applied the three-minute limit and reserving time as a concept. So. We've been a little bit fluid with it. I think it's at your discretion as chair, um, but those are my uh, two cents. Well, that this will take about 30 seconds. Point of order, Mr. Thank President. Yes, Councilmember Bowling. I am quite confident that we've never uh, passed a motion limiting debate that, uh, that limited the number of times that somebody could speak to an issue. Uh, a second bite of the apple is standard for debate. It's not just comment, it's debate. So Mr. Rollins should have a second chance to speak. I would just note uh, as a point of clarification, uh, as a parliamentary matter, um, I, I agree with Council Member Volan. My point was that we did agree on a three minute limit uh, yes. and perhaps did not specify whether or not a second uh, comment and debate was part of that limit. Um, I would sort of assume it is, uh, but again, I think there's some, uh, we've had some fluidity with that. Point of order, who's Thank taking you. time on the three minutes? Our council staff is taking time. So you do, you, you say you have a short comment. Uh, yes, 30 Rose, seconds. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to prevent mischaracterization of my position as well as Susan Sandberg's position. It's not that we're anti-plex. We, we're not resisting plexing in R4. We want to adhere to the comprehensive plan and this process doesn't. Um, Am I excited about plexes everywhere? No, but principally because the, as a profit engine, I think they're likely to drive housing prices up. So this amendment is meant to mitigate this. It is the increasing housing costs as developers bid against home buyers. And then lastly, I invoke Trinitas simply to demonstrate that the market doesn't produce affordable housing unless by subsidy or by incentive. And this is an incentive, and we have that opportunity to provide an incentive on this vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other future bites of the apple from fellow council members? Okay, I'm trying to see everyone. Okay, I'm sorry. Flipping between screens, make sure I see everyone. Okay, seeing no more final comments. Are we ready for the question? on amendment four of ordinance 21-23. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council member Rosenberger. Barger, sorry. You're okay, uh, no. Council member Scambolari. Yes. Council member Sims. No. Council member Flaherty? No. Council member Piedmont Smith? No. Council member Smith? Yes. Council member Sandbrook? Yes. Council member Rollo? Council Member Rollo? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we got you. 
And Council Member Olin. No. Thank you. Amendment four of ordinance 21 23 fails five to four. Mr. President. Yes, Council Member Sandler. I move to adopt Amendment five. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Scambleri. Is this a motion I'm, to introduce? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Let me, let me yeah. back up. Yeah, it's been a long night. Thank you. Please, it's been moved and seconded. Please present. Uh, thank you. I, I'll, I'll start. Um, this amendment uh, restores language uh, that was uh, previously included in the UDO um, that provides the BZA with additional criteria upon which to evaluate conditional use for plex development and conversion. Um, those two criteria involve traffic and adverse impacts. Uh, specifically, the section that includes uh, the pre-submittal neighborhood meetings uh, will be amended such that um, the proposed use and development will not cause undue traffic congestion nor draw significant amounts of traffic through residential streets. And the proposed use and development will not have undue adverse Im impacts upon the adjacent property, the character of the area, or the public health, safety, and general welfare. So we introduced this uh, to ensure that the BZA will be receptive to neighborhood residents uh, providing information and concerns. Uh, and ensures that the BZA will have the freedom within its purview to consider these impacts. Um, this adds a bit more teeth to conditional use review and it respects uh, residents' concerns. Uh, I'll stop there. Councilmember Sandberg, did you have anything to add? Thank you, and if I could clarify, uh, because this is language that came from a prior UDO that is not the one we are taking a look at now, this is going to be added in another section, the one that as this um, was made conditional use by uh, uh, Amendment 2, uh, this will get added to E, review and decision, when uh, dwelling duplexes in R1, R2, and R3 will be conditional use permit petitions for dwelling uh, uses in those zones shall require a pre-submittal neighborhood meeting in accordance with section, uh, and then it quotes that section. So these, these additional things for the BZA to consider are kind of added on in this particular se section, not necessarily added on to the, the 10 BZA criteria that is already established. But again, one of our concerns about the whole idea of adding plexes into the core neighborhoods is that all neighborhoods are so different in their pressure points and their stressors with respect to traffic and parking and, and uh, over occupancy and density that we felt the need to bring back some of this language that had been a part of a previous UDO uh, to once again provide just a little bit more of a guideline to those that are going to be reviewing the conditional uh, use for plexes and with respect to the uniqueness of all the neighborhoods that this could very well impact. So thank you for your consideration of Amendment 5. Sorry, I've done me myself. Thank you very, very much. Um, we'll now go to council members for questions. Um, I think I saw council member Boland's hand up first, then council member Scambleri, and then council member Piedmont Smith, please. Before I ask a question, I, I wanted to hear staff's response to the amendment. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Jackie Scanlon, Development Services Manager. Uh, the Planning and Transportation Department is opposed to Amendment 5. Um, as mentioned by the sponsors, the wording is borrowed from the previous UDO uh, for general regulations for all conditional uses. So when the new UDO was uh, reviewed and adopted by this body, uh, those requirements were consolidated and changed to what we have now um, that again, applies to all conditional uses. The specific regulations being proposed aren't particular or specially related to duplexes. So if we add them here where it's being proposed, 
uh, we will be regulating duplexes much more stringently than the 55 other conditional uses that currently are listed in the UDO, including gravel, cement and sand production, quarries, salvage and scrap yards, vehicle parking garages, sexually oriented businesses, schools, places of worship, jails, and community centers, all uses that have uh, uh, potentially much greater impact on surrounding areas than one additional unit in a home. So these general regulations are written and intended, as I mentioned, for a wide array of uses and duplexes are one of the most innocuous on that list. Um, if this is approved, uh, this will also make it so that the regulations for a duplex in R3, for example, are again, much more stringent um, than the regulations for an eightplex in R4 or any of the other conditional uses uh, listed in code. It just doesn't make sense. Um, regarding the portion uh, proposed use and development will not cause undue traffic congestion nor draw significant amounts of traffic through residential streets. Uh, duplexes are a residential use. That provision, um, which is common, uh, and of course we did used to have in the UDO, is to protect residential streets from the impact of non-residential uses that are trying to locate in or near them. Um, will one extra unit on a block cause undue traffic congestion? Maybe, uh, pretty unlikely in most places in this town. Um, does the existing code cover the few cases where that could be an issue? Uh, yes, it does. So uh, in the existing code requirements for conditional use, um, there is a finding that says adequate public service and facility capacity shall exist in order to accommodate uses permitted under the proposed development at the time the needs or demands arise while maintaining adequate levels of service to existing development. Streets and access within the site and to adjacent properties is listed under that provision, meaning that if the, uh, that if someone can show that the use will, uh, that the area does not have adequate public service and facility capacity, that the roads cannot um, take the traffic caused by one additional unit, that the BZA can deny the petition. Um, the department is opposed to Amendment 5 uh, as it adds general provisions to one specific use in a way that overregulates that particular use for some reason. The issue seems to be that some council members and members of the public are concerned that the conditional use requirements in general are not as strict as they used to be, maybe not strict enough in the current code. If that's the case, they should come back and propose that we amend those regulations uh, so that that will apply to all conditional uses in the UDO equally, not only one of our least impactful um, uses. Uh, additionally, Mr. Rollo indicated, uh, Councilperson Rollo indicated um, that this, one of the reasons for proposing this was so that the BZA would have to be receptive to neighbors. Uh, however, in the existing regulations for conditional uses, um, uh, number four, the petitioner shall make a good faith effort to address concerns of the adjoining property owners in the immediate neighborhood as defined in the pre-submittal neighborhood meeting, which is now required per amendment two um, for the specific pro proposal if such meeting is required. Again, it is. Uh, if the Board of Zoning Appeals does not feel that the petitioner is doing that, uh, they do not have to approve this discretionary approval. Uh, so that is already in code. Um, again, the department is opposed to Amendment 5, uh, does think that the actual solution uh, to the issues we've seen raised is uh, for a potential change to the uh, or general conditional use requirements. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. Um, Councilmember Boland, would you wish to continue? Yes. I'd like to uh, ask my question now. I'd like to ask the sponsors if they could please define the phrase undue traffic on residential streets. How do you define undue? Well, well that would be, go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Councilor Simber. Well, I would say that's up to the discretion of the, you know, the, the BZA members upon testimony of the public, uh, inspecting the, the neighborhood. Uh, I'm sorry, know, I, uh, I'm asking. One could do, I'm asking one could do. Sorry. What do you think? Not the BZA, I'd like to know what, I mean, you're the ones who wrote uh, who want to introduce the word undo, can you please define it to the best of your abilities? Well, I, I, I guess traffic congestion can pr present a problem. And so this is something to consider. So I thought it was worthy to include. This is language that of course had appeared in a previous UDO under um, the, the discretionary criteria to be used in, in determining conditional 
Uh, and so therefore, this is to be determined in these, these free, um, uh, these, these neighborhood meetings, pre-submittal neighborhood meetings for them to present the case that there might be some undue pressure or issues for the BZA to consider. Okay. It's not, it's not for council member Rollo and I to interpret. This would be case by case as it's brought forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, council member Scambellari. Actually, my question was covered. I wanted to hear a response from staff. So thank you. Thank you, council member Piedmont Smith. Uh, same for me. I just wanted to hear from staff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Council member Scambellari, did you have one? Um, I do, but council member Rollo was before me, so. Well, he's the council member Rollo. Uh, I just wanted to clarify what uh, Ms. Scanlon said. So uh, Ms. Scanlon, your objection is that uh, this language, although it appeared in the former UDO and so it was uh, applicable, now is not, uh, but you would support it uh, as a criteria for evaluating other uses. You, you, you object to this, that this, it's only applied to this specific use, is that correct? We object to adding the regulation in, uh, in the process of the 2019-2020 update, the use, uh, the use standards, the conditional use criteria were um, uh, changed and that uh, we felt that the ones that are in there now are adequate, but we do think that if there is concern from the community or council that they're inadequate, that the appropriate way to go about addressing that would be to change, discuss changing the uh, entirety of the general criteria, not adding these specifically uh, to one use. Did that answer your you. question? So, okay, thanks. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Council Member Scambellari. I'm gonna actually me? hold my question for a while, so please go ahead. Do we have any further questions from council members? Okay, look like it's you, Council Member Scambler. I'm sorry, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, this is a question for the sponsors. Um, I It's really hard to prove a negative. So I'm wondering how would, uh, a petitioner prove that um, a development will not cause undue traffic congestion? Are you proposing that they would do a traffic study just for one additional unit or? That, that very, very well could be a remedy um, to actually take a look at the neighbor's concerns, what they will be pointing out in this meeting as to why they feel that additional occupancy on their particular block or with this particular uh, duplex proposal that they could actually prove by demonstrating to whoever wants to, to do this that there are congestion issues in the neighborhood. Um, and then- they could, they could walk it, they could, they could ask for a traffic study. Um, any of those things could be possible remedies for the concern. Well, Council Member Piedmont Smith, if I may, uh, the meeting is already required. That was part of the petition. That was part of the amendment that P Miss that Council Members Piedmont Smith and Sims put forward. So that's not an issue. This amendment is. I'm just to make sure I'm clear. This amendment is only to add the second two provisions. Correct. So because you yeah. So the meeting is not at issue. That's already going to happen. Is part of what we're saying. Those things are already built in uh, that discussion. Thank you. And I understood the question to be, you know, how would the developer of the duplex prove that what they were intending to build would cause harm as the neighborhood may, may raise objections? Do you know how much a traffic study costs? I do not. If you could provide clarification from staff, that would be helpful. Well, I, I mean, I don't think it requires a traffic study per se. It could just require inspecting, knowing what the, the neighborhood consists of, what the street consists of, what the parking on the street consists of, or, do, or doing, uh, or 
or simply counting the traffic in the street. That's relatively inexpensive. I mean, I don't think we're talking about a traffic study necessarily, but I think what Councilmember Sandberg meant or said was to, to have an experiential uh, look and an inspection of what will occur. I mean, that's, it seems to me very much in the, in the spirit of meeting with the neighborhood. And you feel that's not covered by um, the existing criteria that adequate public service and facility capacity shall exist? Yeah, I think that these things are what I've been hearing are uh, the concerns of neighborhoods who are already highly dense, have a lot of rentals, and uh, want to make sure that this doesn't exacerbate it. So we, this is really constituent driven. Um, I mean, it, it is language that appeared before. So but we already, again, I thought it was non-controversial for that reason. But so you're saying the language um, that is already in the new UDO, even without this amendment that says adequate public service and facility capacity shall exist to accommodate the permitted use. You, you think that doesn't cover the basis? This, is, this provides greater specificity. Hmm. Well, even it, it, following the sentence I just read, it says, for example, streets, potable water, sewer, um, vehicle and pedestrian connections. Yes, and this is quite specific to traffic congestion on residential streets and adverse impacts. Okay. Sorry, I'm unmuting myself. Um, I'll take a bite of the apple if that's okay. Then Council Member Scambler and then Council Member Bolin. Um, but I'll just kind of carry that on a little bit further. Um, I was concerned about undue traffic and how that's defined as well. I am also have about the same thoughts with the term adverse impacts and character of the area. And I guess I wanna know who and how is that defined? Is that based on the neighbor's public comments or I don't, is that defined somewhere? Is that codified somewhere? What adverse impacts mean or is that something other than what we already have in the UD. I guess I'm just not clear on what that means. Yes, I can understand the, the uh, concern about that. But once again, this would be neighborhood by neighborhood. This would be all discussed within these pre-submittal meetings as, as to what, you know, what would be proposed once it's discussed with the neighborhood and for them to have a reaction as to how that's going to impact uh, the 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 uh, adjoining properties. That's my role. Well, yeah, I would just say that, when, yeah, I, uh, the core neighborhoods have a history of um, adverse impacts from uh, high rentals and uh, driven by a student market, and um, you know it in, it involves noise, it, it involves uh, things like traffic congestion and, and, and so forth. So this simply is a means by which, you know, the people who are living in the neighborhoods uh, communicate and it makes it clear, it codifies that the BZA will be looking for those sorts of measures of adverse impacts. Um, I, I frankly don't find this controversial. Oh, I think that uh, this uh, is just a conduit for uh, better communication. Well, I, I will say, um, I'm not so sure asking questions, at least from my part, should be considered controversial. Um, I guess, okay, thank you. Um, we'll move on, I do believe. Are you ready, Council Member Scambler? I am, thank you for then Council, me, but... No, you're fine, then Council Member Boland, and then Council Member Clary, if you don't mind. Well, can, can I specify that this was in the previous UDO and we didn't find it controversial, did we? No, it's okay, we heard um, already from uh, staff on, on that position. Councilmember Scambler. Um, yes, and thank you for giving me some time to organize my thoughts. Um, 
In a way, I think I, I have kind of the same questions that Councilmember Piedmont Smith had, and I just need to be walked through it a little more explicitly. Um, there are three conditions included here, the pre-submittal meeting, the traffic congestion, and the undue adverse impact. And Ms. Scanlon, if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that these are covered elsewhere. We covered the pre-submittal meeting, neighborhood meeting, in an earlier amendment, correct? Correct. And then for the undue traffic and the undue adverse impact, where else are those controls in the UDO? For those of us who don't have a UDO sitting in front of us right now. Um, sure, so they are in the particular approval criteria for conditional uses. So the question that uh, council member Piedmont Smith raised, and then again by council member Sims about how exactly do you define um, these very specific terms that were in the previous UDO, goes to why they came out, I believe. Um, because how do you prove whether or not a duplex is going to cause, will cause undue traffic congestion? Um, you don't know who's gonna live there, uh, it, what cars they'll own. That's not something you know before you give the approval. Um, so some of these previous conditions, I think were uh, probably too specific and hard to actually make findings for, for petitioners. Um, so I believe that's why they were generalized uh, and put in the code as they are now, again, under the uh, con conditional use criteria um, under common review procedure. So is it uh, the, the phrase burden of proof keeps running through my head. So is it accurate to say the burden of proof rests with the petitioner for the yes. most part? Yeah. Okay. I would say so. And then I don't know if um, Mr. Rooker's here, if he would correct me on that. Oh, he's not, um, he's only as a guest, but uh, let's see. Sorry about that. If you, I would say so, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Bolin. Yes, um, uh, the most egregious example of local congestion I can think of is being discussed recently um, by residents of Blue Ridge who are concerned that the closure of lower cascades will completely hem them in during IU football games when there's no easy outlet from Blue Ridge. Um, uh, do, are, are you saying, are, are the sponsors saying that, um, uh, you know, that anything that, I mean, how much lower than that is, is congestion? I mean, I think that's a legitimate uh, concern um, but I mean, the typical congestion of adding one additional unit more than a single family house would add seems like it would pale in comparison. Do you see why I ask the question about uh, what kind of a congestion that a street might endure because a duplex is built on it? Well, again, back to the question about, you know, uh, proving in advance who is going to be residing in these duplexes. No one knows that at the point of you're, you're putting a petition in to, to create one. But it's fair to say that if you are doubling the occupancy of, of where a single family home existed, there will be two families living there as opposed to one. I think you can kind of uh, predict ahead if additional cars in that neighborhood could cause a problem for a neighborhood that already has congestion issues. I think that's fair um, to, to just have this as a safeguard, as a point of discussion. It's okay. not specifically mentioned in the current criteria for the BZA. This puts that back on the table for a possible discussion. Okay. Um, okay. And so I, th I think that's fair, even though that's, this is, of course, a much smaller scale than sure. the issue with Cascades. That was, that, that's my point. But uh, as a follow-up, um, does, do the sponsors see the potential result of a traffic study might be to require a duplex to provide more off-street parking as a result? Well, requiring off-street parking in a neighborhood where parking is already wall-to-wall, -wall, that's going to be difficult. You mean that no, they no, might no, no. have to- Off-street off parking. In other words, that- as Oh, a result, like, like a study, driveway, yeah. Or yeah, that's right. Do you, do you imagine that that might be a result of, uh, or, or, or is it just a matter of approving the duplex at all or not approving it? 
Well, that's possible. I think the whole point of having these neighborhood meetings is to discuss any factor that could cause an issue that could get solved before the um, the approval is granted and, and the duplex goes in. This is not to prevent a duplex from coming in per se, it's to allow the neighbors to voice uh, any concern and possibly have the, um, the developer uh, solve that problem and off street parking would be a solution to that. Yes, very much so. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the presentation, uh, amendment sponsors. Am I, am I understanding uh, the sponsors reasoning correctly that, that you feel traffic impacts are a pretty context sensitive or case sensitive thing and that the addition of an extra unit on some blocks, say with the conversion of a single family home to a duplex may cause undue traffic congestion or an undue adverse impact in some cases. Is that right? <clears throat> Yes. It possibly could, and it's sensitive to the individual unique neighbors. For some, it's not going to be an issue at all. For others, it could very well be. Okay, so you just agreed that one additional housing unit may cause undue adverse impacts on traffic or parking in a neighborhood. Do you then support changing detached single-family homes to a conditional use so that if one additional unit in the form of a single-family home going in on a vacant lot leads to exactly this type of adverse impact or undue traffic congestion that you're concerned about. Would you support that change too, since it's the same one additional unit? Well, that is not what this is, is, is addressing at the moment. So. That's right. I'm just asking if you'd support it, applying the reasoning equally to, to all houses. No, because I think, Councilmember Flaherty, I think that the, really the, uh, the unspoken presumption that we're using here is that this is a, a student-driven rental market. And so, you know, the, because of that, there are certain conditions that the neighborhoods have endured in the past. So the type that, of, that they're the type sensitive of resident? About. I'm sorry, go on. <laughs> so this is, this is the concern, I think, that's, uh, that, the, that the core neighborhoods are Yes, and this is this is why affordability is not at all likely, and it's why housing prices are likely to go up, and it's because we live in a college town, and so, it's just, it simply drives the market. So, okay. so it, you're you're it, these are non sequiturs, really. I, I think the reply was a non sequitur, respectfully. Uh, I uh, following up, uh, we've at, we've just asked about two situations where one additional housing unit may go in. In one of them, sponsors, the amendment sponsors would support a conditional use process that requires looking into it. In the other case, you would not support that. And the difference I, I just heard articulated was that in one case, the drivers or occupants of the, the house might be students. And in the other case, they would probably not be students. Is that correct? Well, I'm having a hard time grasping your scenario about a house, a single family detached house being built on an empty lot, as it opposed happens. to a duplex being com, com, a, a single family home being converted or, 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 you know, to a duplex that would literally double the occupancy, two families yes. living there as opposed to one family living there. And so for me, that is the difference and why I would say no. And again, we are dealing with a new entity here, which are duplexes being introduced for the very first time in core neighborhoods. And we are responding with this amendment to concerns that we hear repeatedly from the neighbors who have experienced what happens when there's over occupancy and what happens when things are deregulated and there are no, um, and there are no safeguards. And so I feel that there is a complete different uh, argument being presented here about uh, being negative toward single family detached homes. That's not what we're trying to provide some protection for at the moment. It's the new introduction of duplexes that could very well cause some undue harms or some undue stresses that the neighbors ought to have a right to be able to talk about. And another thing that's been brought to my attention by residents, by constituents, uh, people I visited recently has to do with the, uh, the additional number of trash bins in an area where they can't even put their trash bins out and be in accordance with the pickup rules because there's just no room for them to be put out because of all the, the, the uh, congestion on the streets. Okay, thanks. So, thank I, would just, I, would just, I would just also add, uh, Councilmember Flaherty, that 
you know, we do have an expiration date on the time uh, in the 150 foot buffer. And so because the economic incentive is so great to Plex homes, it's going to far outweigh, you know, the odd single family detached home that's going to be built on an empty lot in the neighborhood. Wouldn't you agree? No, I, I described two scenarios in which there was one incremental housing unit, single family conversion to a duplex family, uh, two family home, that's one incremental unit, empty lot to a single family home, that's one incremental unit. By your own reasoning, either of those two situations would apply identical uh, additional strain on traffic or, or congestion in the neighborhood. And I just clarified that we would not treat those equally. So thank you very much. Okay, well. Thank you. Do we have any further? Councilmember P. Ma Smith. Yes, um, in your amendment, it talks about, uh, um, sorry, let me pull it up again to have the exact wording. Uh, the proposed use and development will not have undue adverse impacts upon the adjacent property or the character of the area. Who determines the character of the area? Yeah, I think Council Member Sims asked the same question and did not get a response. Well, I think it's the experience of the of the residents in the neighborhood can describe that. So does the character of an area ever change? Uh, sure, it does. OK, so the current residents will determine what the character They can describe it. I think the BZA is going to determine. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's up to the BZA. The it's, not the it's not the neighbors, but the neighbors would have a right to, to have that brought into the discussion. I, yeah, I, I just find that term so vague that I, I don't know how the BZA could make a determination. But anyway. Well, what will occur at the pre-submittal meeting? Pardon me? I, you know, I guess what we're, we're doing here is to try to uh, direct the BZA to, to understand the nature of the concerns of the, of the residents of the neighborhoods. And, um, you know, there is a pre-submittal meeting that is required currently, but that's vague too. We don't know what will occur at the pre-submittal meeting. And yet we, uh, we made that code. Okay. Do you have any other, Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions from staff or council? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm flipping around just a little bit. Make sure I don't miss anyone. Okay. Seeing none, um, then we'll go to public comment on amendment. Five of Ordinance 21-23. I will remind you that if you'd like to speak, please indicate by using a raised hand function in Zoom, or you can send a note to our meeting host um, indicating that you would like to speak publicly. Um, if in fact there's more than one person on the device, please let us know that so we could accommodate you and we're still in the three minute zone, um, at least for the next 40 minutes. Um, okay, Ms. Lacey, who do we have? First up, we have Dave Warren, who should be able to unmute. Hello again, everybody. Um, thanks for sticking around. Um, uh, and just a quick related point. Um, this is not the first time duplexes have been introduced to the core neighborhoods. Um, they were allowed to be there for you know, to be added for decades before they were banned um, because some residents didn't want certain people in their neighborhood, um, namely students. Um, as for Amendment 5, um, I'm asking you to vote against that um, for many of the reasons that planning staff already shared. Uh, again, if you want to address traffic concerns, you can do that with other ordinances and initiatives. If you want to address, uh, to address parking concerns, uh, use the parking ordinance. If you're concerned about noise, make changes to that ordinance. Uh, we have a housing shortage, uh, and our zoning code should not be used as a kludge to solve all these other problems that are better addressed outside of the city's zoning code. Um, I also want to reiterate an important point. 
um, we already rely on the market to, pro to provide almost all of our housing. Uh, allowing conditional duplexes does not change that one bit. It's the same market, uh, but our zoning rules force that market to constrain themselves to only providing the most expensive homes in most of the city. And so it should not be a surprise that the result of that is really unaffordable housing. Um, it's understandable, uh, but folly to think that by adding more and more controls and restrictions on more affordable housing forms like duplexes, all of which add costs, that we will get more affordable housing types. Uh, all this does is incentivize the market to keep doing what it's already doing. And that involves existing homeowners and investors buying single family homes and turning them into expensive luxury single family homes. Adding the additional layer of complexity that is Amendment 5 would just help to continue this trend. Please vote against it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Moore. Who do we have next? Next, we have Greg Alexander, who should be able to unmute. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Greg Alexander. I oppose Amendment 5. Um, I mean, it's bad policy. It, it seems pretty vague to me, but on the other hand, uh, you could really imagine it um, being used just as a, an excuse to, to, to say how much you hate renters. You know, uh, I've seen how neighbors treat the whole duplex issue. Um, but it is so insulting to me personally because I live on Madison Street, what, what becomes Kinzer Pike just north of me, and almost every single person that lives in the, the copious housing on North Kinzer, some of it is multifamily, but mostly single family, almost every one of them drives directly in front of my house and I smell their exhaust. Um, if you look at like the new um, parking garage on uh, the tech park that the city is building, uh, spent $12 million on it last year, if I understand correctly, uh, the people that, that park at that garage are very likely a significant fraction of them are going to drive directly in front of my house. Um, if you live in Ellettsville, you are going to wind up putting a bunch of traffic on the bigger roads in our, in our city. And just because they're big roads doesn't mean that putting traffic on them doesn't harm me. If I cross, I have to go, um, there's a drugstore two blocks from my house. It's fantastic that I live so close to this drugstore, but I have to cross a highway to get there because our city puts so much effort into giving car access to people who live in other counties. And if I had some sort of veto power to say, you know, if you build another house with another three car garage north of this city, it's gonna harm my neighborhood. Man, I would love that power. We really need to, to put this, this car thing in perspective here, that there is a, a, a cost to traffic that is separate from the cost to housing. And the fact of the matter is people who live in duplexes in core neighborhoods use a lot less cars. They travel a lot less miles. They have fewer cars per household. They have fewer trips per car. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander, for your comments. Um, I'll just remind everyone else that these are comments for Amendment 5. Um, what do we have next? Ms. Next we have... Next, we have the person with the screen name, Peter, who should be able to unmute and state their name for the record. Yes, hi, Peter Dorfman again, uh, near West Side. This whole discussion goes to the constantly repeated suggestion that the introduction of duplexes is incremental. One duplex on a street is incremental. The general opening of neighborhoods to duplexing, even if that happens over a period of years, can be transformative. It is not incremental. We have to stop talking about this issue as if we're debating the creation of one duplex. I want to reiterate something that I've said before in, in other meetings. We have hard data, and the data show that while we don't have the kinds of housing we need, we do not have a housing shortage in Bloomington, period, end of story. The core residents that you're hearing from are generally concerned about the impact of density, but this issue of traffic and parking, all the car related issues that used to be embodied in the requirements in the UDO is the issue that neighborhoods, that residents of neighbors, my, neighborhoods like mine, where the streets are 23 feet wide and the cars can't pass one another without slowing down and where we have on street parking on one side of the street. This is the issue that people really care about. I'm not confident that it's covered by the general criterion about adequate public services and infrastructure. I don't think most people that you're gonna hear from tonight are confident that that covers it. 
this is one of the reasons why the people in the core neighborhood has, have com- repeatedly pointed out their current density relative to the many other places within Bloomington where multifamily houses could be built. It's the main reason we objected to density. It's the main reason we consider density a burden. It's about cars. I understand the, con- the concern about the imprecision of the language regarding the undue impacts and the character of neighborhoods. What this is gonna come down to is a BZA hearing where the, the members of the BZA have to listen to the interaction between the petitioner and the neighbors and make a judgment call on whether the petitioner is acting in good faith. And there's, there really is no specific language that you can use to get around that. That's what it's gonna come down to. I have confidence that they can do it. I actually agree with Jackie Scanlon that this should be applied to all conditional uses, not just duplexes. But this refinement is urgently needed in this case. And for this reason, I hope you'll support Amendment 5. We've been hearing a lot of what I consider a false equivalence between single family house and a duplex. I'm hearing this as a disingenuous rhetorical gimmick, but I could see supporting new detached single family houses as conditional. If we argue that our neighborhoods are dense enough now, that actually sounds pretty reasonable in the core. I don't know that people would agree in in more uh, spread out and and capacious neighborhoods, but in in neighborhoods- I'm sorry you've exhausted your time. I'm sorry Thank you've you. exhausted your time. Thank you. Please, who's please next, support please? Amendment 5. Who's next, please? Next, we have Ioban Bender. You should be able to unmute. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> this is Ioban Minder. You know, I, uh, I, I, I think if you're sitting here tonight, presumably you think that our city, uh, you know, our society should have laws that apply to everyone equitably or equitably and uh, fairly, right? You know, the, the language that was in the old U- UDO and was later removed, all the stuff about character of the area, I mean, that was removed for a reason. And the reason is that if you apply vague case-by-case criteria, especially for something like housing, then you inevitably introduce different standards for different people. And I really think the risk is compounded when you're talking about a housing type uh, that's often inhabited by lower income families. So I I actually feel silly for asking council to vote against this amendment. I I mean, I I think you will. Uh, So instead, I'm I'm gonna ask the amendment sponsors to withdraw it. Uh, You've talked a lot about being serious and and earnest here in in this process. So I, I think it's time to walk the walk here, thanks. Thank you for your comments. What do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have Pam Weaver, and there are two individuals on this one um, device. Uh, they should be able to unmute and state their name for the record. Hi, it's Pam Weaver. You can hear me, I hope. Yes. Um, so I kind of agree with the just, just previous speaker to me that I wish that Marlowe and Sandberg would withdraw this amendment because, you know, one question I have is how many amendments will they submit? Uh, how much time will I need to spend bird dogging this? Um, it's turned into kind of a filibuster, in my opinion, um, and is just a red herring. Um, I want to also speak to the speaker before that, who who mentioned about, you know, um, saying, yeah, well, maybe we should have the same um, criteria for single family people, uh, and yeah, I totally agree with Matt's, you know, where he goes with that, and I I have to say that on that side, if there are sides, I've heard lots of people say, oh, we don't need duplexes because we can use up empty lots and I mean I I'm in the Bryan Park neighborhood there are several empty lots and you know that would be basically putting barriers in front of someone who happens to have a double lot splitting off one lot and selling it even for a single family so I I just find this um 
really frivolous. I find it, I like it. I want to call a spade a spade here. It's just one more way to um, limit who we live next to and um, who we don't live next to. And it is really upsetting to me. So yeah, please just withdraw it. I hear a second person. Thank you. We're ready for the second person. This is Dave Weaver. Um, echoing Pam's comments, please vote no on this latest filibuster amendment five. It appears to be frivolous and disingenuous. The UDO has plenty of controls and safeguards if one cares to read it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. President, point of order. Yes. Could I ask you to remind the public that uh, members uh, should be addressed by title, not by first name, that my colleagues have earned uh, their right to be treated as council members, and also that they should only address the chair and not uh, address uh, any member directly. Thank you. Duly noted. Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have Richard Lewis, who should be able to unmute. Thank you all, President Sims. Thank you, Ms. Lacey. Uh, thank you, council members. Once again, I know it's a long evening and I appreciate uh, your taking the time to hear our voices. Um, I support this amendment. I do think it provides an opportunity for local neighborhoods uh, and communities to provide their voice, and which in some cases could be positive. I know there have been uh, developments in Prospect Hill that I've been supportive of, um, and including neighbors' ADUs um, that I've, I've appreciated the chance to speak out about in neighborhood meetings. Um, in Prospect Hill, uh, we have arterial streets such as uh, South Rogers and West Kirkwood. We have connector streets, and then we have things that I'm sure this is not a technical term, but I would call them glorified alleys, such as Smith Avenue, which is a very narrow, uh, single lane street with parking along the side. And so the differences in those streets and, and the connectors, I think does make a difference in as far as traffic flow. And I, I don't think that we can ignore the fact that a duplex doubles the density on a particular lot. Uh, you may say that if it's a converted duplex, you're only adding to one side, but still overall it, it doubles the density. Um, I am concerned by what I hear to be antagonism toward single family housing, it's still something that many people aspire to. And I think, you know, if we're talking about uh, different, different tools in our toolboxes, I think to antagonize single family housing is, is a bit regrettable. Um, I do wanna speak in favor of, of, all of all of these private citizens who are raising their voices tonight and, and many nights. We are not public representatives. I am not an elected official. I do not speak here because I, love this moment. I speak here because I feel compelled to voice my objections, which I think I've been consistent about this year in front of uh, the planning department themselves, plan commission, and now you all. And I realize you're just hearing the tail end of months of discussion. My objections are still that we cannot enforce owner occupancy and that we are still opening the doors to market rate developments, which in all likelihood for profitability purposes will be high market rate rentals. I don't object to renters. Again, my husband was a long-term renter as, as was I when I was in school here. But to ignore these facts and to ignore the increased density in our already dense core neighborhoods, I think is, is a mistake. I do support this amendment and I hope you will give it due consideration. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next we have Tom Mellon who should be able to unmute. Hi, um, my name is Tom Mellon, live in Bryan Park neighborhood. And I'd sent a letter to the um, council a couple of weeks ago concerning issues on infrastructure. And so I see what's gonna happen is, is an impact on the infrastructure, stressing the infrastructure. Um, so therefore I'm, I'm supportive of uh, amendment five and I, I appreciate the two council people to to have uh, put this forth uh, because infrastructure, it seems to be uh, either ignored or, or that, that hasn't been planned well. So that's it. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? 
Next, we have a person with the screen name Cynthia who should be able to unmute and um, give their full name. Cynthia Bretheim. Please support Amendment 5. Some neighborhood streets are 21 feet wide. Some streets are much wider. And it, you can consider the problems because X number of bedrooms often have X number of cars. Please also consider whether there's adequate parking. Is there space to turn cars around on some short ended streets in Bryan Park? If anybody's ever driven through Bryan Park on Grimes, you have a whole slew of houses that have that are about half of a block short and they're not very wide and there are no sidewalks and adding four to six cars there might cause a problem. Unfortunately, um, the Board of Zoning Appeals, which has to listen to conditional comments by citizens who may find that makes it difficult for them or their children or their pets to get around, will probably be listened to about as well as planning has listened to some of these amendments. So that's unfortunate. I'm still hoping that we can find some way to heal the persistent demonstrations of lack of respect, the persistent name calling and assumptions that are made and it's gonna take a big effort to do that. Um, when this many people show up this late at night, while you all are doing your work, which is not made any easier, the added prickliness just makes it more painful. I'm really sorry for that. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to make us trust one another better and I just hope that we will all make some efforts in that direction. And I support Amendment 5. Thank you all for your hard work. Thank you for everybody who takes the time to comment and who cares. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Who do we have next, please? Next, we have Jeffrey Bundy, who should be able to unmute. Thank you, uh, President Sims. Thank you for to the council members. Um, I applaud first, first and foremost, uh, council, council person Rallo and Sandberg for standing up and being willing to propose amendments in spite of what was previously said by others to defend, you know, the rights and interests of homeowners. Um, I bought a house in Bloomington a year ago, and I'm currently in the process of renovating it. Um, I believe that the decision not to vote for Amendment 4 raises my property value based on what I've seen in California. I'm currently sitting in California, um, moving in a few weeks to my wife's hometown, back to Bloomington, and, you know, care about that community. Eyes wide open, I know fully that I'm moving into a student community, fully accept that. I'm not voting against that because I'm voting into it even as a Purdue grad moving into an IU community, somehow I will figure that part out as well. Um, but you know, I live in a community, Palo Alto, California, right near Stanford University, wrestled with a lot of these things. Um, we can get into a long debate about what California is doing right and wrong, but I can tell you, I've, and in our neighborhoods um, that are being overrun by corporate investors and out of town investors just buying property for real estate value, um, what you did in the in the previous amendment raised my property value, and I'm thankful for that because I do believe that's going to happen. Um, but what I, I don't understand why anybody would vote against this amendment because you're simply saying you don't care about the opinions of the neighbors in a neighborhood that that are having this impact. That's what you're saying. Would you write an amendment that says we don't care about the traffic patterns or the, the detrimental impact of the neighborhood of this duplex coming in. If you vote against it, that's what you're saying in my mind. So, you know, choose, choose what you want, but essentially, you know, the converse art argument is that. And I'll leave with that. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I look forward to being in Bloomington very, very soon. Just bought my season tickets to IU football. So 
um, I guess, go Hoosiers at least most of the games. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have Kathy Crabtree. You should be able to unmute. Hi. Can you hear me? We sure can. You have three minutes. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, still Kathy Crabtree, still a near west side neighborhood. Um, to the earlier speaker's point, I'm in an impacted neighborhood, and I think my voice should count too. Adding even more restrictions to duplexes will undermine the goal of adding duplexes. <laughs> Complicating duplexes especially discourages current homeowners wishing to convert their homes or small scale local developers who would like to invest in their neighborhoods, but do not have the capacity, time or funds to navigate a complex permitting process. Making conditional approval for duplexes subject to very broad, vague criteria puts this housing type at an unfair disadvantage. The UDO already includes several use specific standards reserved for duplexes. Car parking concerns and traffic concerns can be handled by broadening parking services and permit zones. Bottom line, adding even more restrictions will undermine the goal of adding duplexes. I'm baffled by the responses or honestly the lack of responses to the legitimate questions that council members Piedmont, Smith and Flaherty raised. The questions were straightforward and I think the inability of the sponsors to answer them coherently is an answer in itself. As I said, I live in the near west side. I'm not sure why it's a problem for Peter to have to slow down and move over while a car goes by. I don't have a problem with that. I knew that when I moved here. I also agree with the earlier comment that the sponsors of this amendment should withdraw it. It's embarrassing. If they don't withdraw it, then I please ask council members to vote no. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have Chris Sturbaum, who should be able to unmute. Yes, thank you and good evening again. You know, what's missing from a lot of these comments is a long-term perspective on what's been happening in the neighborhoods over a great period of time. I've been going to BZA meetings for 40 years. And these, these criteria are just about as old as I am. And they've worked. And there really is an issue about caring about the perspective of people that live in these areas. They're all different. They all have different problems. They all have specific issues. And you know who the experts on those are? The people that live on that street. They know very well what's going to happen when something happens. And you know, I've heard people in this administration say, neighborhoods are special interest groups. They're problems. They're in the way. We know best. You know, that's, that's how a dictatorship works. That's not how a, a real democracy works that wants to work with their community and that actually cares how this affects Mrs. Smith and Mr. Jones down the street. They need to care. And, you know, I've really, I remember the president's wife wearing a sweatshirt that said, I really don't care. And that is an impression that the community gets when you basically say, I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen. And when you distrust the people that come to that meeting and think you're working against your community because we really understand what's going on more than you do. The BCA is gonna listen and an adverse effect is an adverse effect. You know it when you see it. I mean, that's what you have a committee for. They're citizens and they listen and they say, we are in general wanting these forms to happen, but we want to listen. We don't want to impose them where they're going to cause a problem. And the people that laugh and think, oh, that could never happen. How could these naive people think? It's experience, it's real. And I've worked in almost every neighborhood and every street in this town and 
They're all different. They're all going to have different issues. Listen to them. Build that into the prospect of how you're going to put this in. And if you really don't want to listen, this is how you're going to tell them. Just tell them you don't care. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, please? Next, we have Margaret Clements, who should be able to unmute. Well, I uh, wasn't going to speak at this time, but when I heard kind of the disrespectful and dis dismissive comments by some of my fellow community members and their attacks on council members for their goodwill eff efforts to attend to some of the community's concerns about real issues that impact um, the people who are staying here till 11 o'clock at night, night after night after night. I just really wanted to thank council members uh, Sandberg and Rallo for um, spending all that extra time coming up with a good amendment that addresses so many concerns of the residents of Bloomington, the long-term residents of Bloomington. I appreciate your listening to us. I appreciate your listening to me and to the people who disagree with me. I've spent hundreds of hours researching data for this um, uh, council, and I've been called uh, a disinformationist by staff. And I'm, uh, I do think that the tone really needs to improve. And I see, as I'm sitting here, council members uh, shaking their head no when residents speak as though they're having a visceral reaction to the mere idea that a person might have a car or a need for a car. Um, but we are addressing very real lives of real people who have real concerns and also may have a car. <laughs> you probably do have a car if the statistics are right. And so um, to, to be thoughtful, to include the concerns um, and to al allow a mechanism for the various communities to, um, to address uh, unanticipated consequences of these changes is I think a very wise move. And I really appreciate the extra time and the consideration that council members Sandberg and Rallo put into uh, to this tonight. So thank you. Thank you. What do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have um, Janice Sorby. You should be able to unmute. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, it's Jan Sorby again. The duplex adds increased use on a property. It adds more cars, more people, more friends, more trips. The duplex may add an additional six cars per lot or more. Our blocks in Bryan Park are dense. We have about five structures per block. The additional traffic and congestion will have a vastly different effect than in Hyde Park, who may have only two or three houses per block. We have about 60% rental now, and that means we're starting with an overabundance of cars because many of the houses have three unrelated people and have three cars or more. Much of Bryan Park was built before the accommodation of cars was a thing. When Bryan Park was built, not many people had cars. And the result is that many of the houses don't have on-site parking. Additionally, Henderson and Hillside and Walnut do not have parking, so the units there misuse the, the side streets or the other streets. Our streets are narrow, some are the size of an alley at 10 feet. And only a few years ago, they were, <laughs> they were gravel. We don't have any curbs, gutters, or stormwater or, or sewers. Our streets are rutted out and crumbling. We have no sidewalks and must use the street for walking. And people who you know, say they want people to walk, these additional burden of the cars could very well be a problem, could very well be a problem. And it would be up to BZA to look at each of these sites and see if it would be a problem or maybe it wouldn't be a problem. As I've said before, my neighborhood has no historic protection in the idea of providing some kind of protection to protect the character of this neighborhood is not outrageous. The language of the, amend the amendment was part of the last UDO. It is typical language found in UDOs all across the country. 
some of this verbiage was okay for years, but tonight it's not okay. And that is deeply troubling. I was in favor of Amendment 2, which would have included neighborhood studies. This would have identified problems in ideal places to put plexus and ensure that it would be architecturally fit with the character of each different neighborhood. Our neighborhoods are different across the city, and that would have assured the integrity would remain. I want to thank you uh, to Council Member Rollo and Sandberg for trying to mitigate the impact of the duplexes and trying to answer questions that still remain with many of us. It seems our concerns and our questions have not even had an attempt to be answered by any of the rest of the city council members. We are people, we have ideas, we do research, and I would have appreciated at least a little consideration. Thank, Thank you. you for your comments, Ms. Sorby. Yes, who do we have next, Ms. Lacey? Next, we have Wendy Bernstein, who should be able to unmute. Hi, I just want to say that I'm a neighborhood constituent of Dave Rollo and <clears throat> of Susan Sandberg and you other at-large council members. I have respect for every one of you council members. I have great respect for your commitments to our city and the intelligence you bring to your deliberations and questions. I'm very grateful to those of you who've taken a lot of time to participate in our neighborhood meetings. I wish I felt the respect of my fellow Bloomington citizens. And I hope that I haven't shown disrespect for you. Um, it feels quite disappointing and uncomfortable to have people arguing about what and how other people think. Um, I have been critical of people in their official governing roles. I consider that I'm critical of their policies, not them, because there are good intentions on all sides. And I just so wish for what Cynthia Bretheim has also wished for that um, and many others that we could be collaborative and mutually respectful. And I think that the efforts of Susan Sandberg and Dave Rollo in their amendments are very altruistic and reflective of the constituents they represent. And it is so sad that we can all be somewhat right and none of us is all the way wrong. And so I hope that we can really work to be respectful and I greatly appreciate the creative efforts of thinking in new ways of Representative Sandberg and Rollo. I thank you so much and I thank all the council members for your time and hard work. Thank you for your comments. Um, before we go any further, we're approaching the 11 o'clock hour. Um, we have an option that we as council, we can just list who are wanting to speak like we did two meetings ago and continue tomorrow. Or I will entertain a motion to extend for about 30 minutes um, if we can get through um, our last two public commenters, and if our my colleagues can be brief in their comments, we can probably finish up this amendment. So, um, um, my parliamentarian, President Sims, I, um, I see we have a few additional hands, um, but uh, uh, now five. Um, uh, sorry, I was going to make a motion to, to extend. We uh, recess no later than 1130, but um, with the hope of, of um, uh, finishing our work on this amendment tonight, but I'm not sure that's so prudent given the volume of the comment now. I, I, okay. I no, no, thank you. Guidance, perhaps. No, I, I think you're absolutely correct. 
Um, Ms. Lacey, can you document those that are waiting? Okay. You can let me know when you've got that completed. I have in the queue RM, who I believe is Renee Miller, John Lawrence, Russ Skiba, the screen name Vindy, Ben Lee, who is Wendy. Um, Frank, I believe. Yes, thank brush. you. I'm sorry. Fresh. Yes, and Eric. Okay, thank you. I, I do not have I do not have any chat messages on Amendment Five. Okay, that's good. Um, I will remind the people that are remaining that when they are acknowledged to speak, we are still on Amendment 5 of Ordinance 21-23. And as per our suspended rules, um, I will entertain a motion to recess. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. We will reconvene tomorrow at 6.30. Um, in special session. Again, starting with final comments for this amendment five, and then we'll move on to uh, finalizing ordinance 21 23. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate your public comments, and uh, my colleagues get some rest. We'll see you tomorrow.